you've got questions, would you please just raise your hand and she'll take them. Go ahead. Uh, my background is uh, environment, energy, and other stuff. What we are doing, I would like to have an opinion, is like first law of the world, energy can only be transformed, cannot be created, and all, all we are doing is transforming, in case of an oil, digging out the centuries old animals, which have become the oil, and we are using it, producing CO2, CO, etc., etc., and solid waste, and we put it someplace. One of the case studies I got involved, and I'd like to have your opinion, is during the First World War, Naplam and uh, all other gases were being produced. Uh, some of them were used in the war in uh, Korea and Vietnam. Uh, you know, burning the body, the highly, highly toxic gases, they are all buried someplace. So all we are doing is deferring the problem. They are buried in the Vega, uh, you know, in Nevada, Colorado border area. And uh, highly, highly toxic, like selling gas, which kills the people. What is the solution? All we are doing is, uh, as we become poor, civilized, we are digging up more, we are using up more resources, and then we reach a point we cannot use it anymore, so we dump it someplace or burn it, it again it goes in a, it's a cycle of uh, non-life type situation. Your comment on possible, maybe potential solution. That's a very great and difficult question. I think in many ways in my practice, what I try to think about is the sense of metabolism as a method of living and creating. So I don't think there's any problem with materials being transformed, energy being um, exchanged, because that's nature, right? Because we eat, we die, we poop, we're becoming material back to the plants again. The problem of our current society and the capital itself is this concentration. That's what I was trying to think a lot about time and material. That they are block, like it's a blockage of this natural process of metabolism, like letting it flow. It's like money is not the worst thing. If you are spending it, you are like regenerating opportunities back to the economy. It's the concentration of that. It's like when it gets stuck. It's like a healthy body, but then the blood no longer flow anymore. So that's really what I think is, is crucial for our society to slowly realizing that. And of course, there are lots of kind of initiative around circular economy, sustainability, that is looking at that, not just to say, no, we are not stopping everything. That's also just simply unrealistic. But to think about how to keep the flow of materials, of time that is moving, it's, it's almost philosophical. But at the same time, I think it can be put into practical use. I, on the side jobs, I sometimes advise technological companies and really use metabolism as like a framework to ask when people developing systems, no matter is businesses or technologies or artworks, just think about the lifespan. Because I think it's important for us to confront death. If you can think about death at the end of something, and you realize we're like smaller, and there's is possibilities for the next generation, the next person, the next being, next nature, next tree, to take it. Um, for another possibilities of the materials that we are so attached to at the moment. But, but we can talk more. Uh, okay. At the, okay, I don't <laughs> want to take away the time yeah, from the desk. So I would like you to please share about your work with Ha and oral history, oh, yes. how it inspires you, mm -hmm. and also how do you envision that work, in what medium do you envision that work being materialized? Yeah, so my experience with Ha has been quite transformative because as I was talking about, this is my 10th year in the United States. And I think 
only until two years ago, I was first called Asian American by a friend. And it was a moment, I think for her, it was just very casually, but it really, really struck me that I have really acquired identity and be accepted. Um, so when I was doing the research in Ha, the first couple of weeks, I was literally just reading. And what I found particularly interesting is that though every story is unique, there are historical events very much shared in communities, like in, for example, stories about Indian immigrants. There's always a mention of arranged marriages, and for Vietnamese, there's always reference to the war. Um, so the interesting thing for me is that because everyone come into those historical events from a different angle, different class, different background, different beliefs, they make very different choices. And that led to diverged life passes. So that's particularly what I was interested in. So right now, I'm working uh, with um, the hot interns and computer science uh, departments and professors in RISE to utilize uh, large language models um, to be able to extract those uh, call it nexus events in the archive and looking at how people are making decisions differently. I want to create a map of that moments of extreme desires or fears or tensions within and with the world. And in the meantime, um, of course, my residency is short. That's like my first step. My goal, maybe one day I hope to achieve, is to be able to make some kind of like interactive piece that instead of reading through uh, 450 articles, um, maybe you could just have the agent that you can talk to and kind of going through those events and looking at how you make those choices and then be able to draw documents from the archive who share or not share your decisions. And I think that could be very inspiring. Um, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm working on and it has been quite uh, interesting from both technical um, and artistic perspective. Share your personal story, how you went from engineering to art and where you are today. Yeah, so I was trained in mechanical engineer, um, trained as a mechanical engineer in undergrad, which you can probably have some of my aesthetic choices. Um, but when I graduated from undergrad, I do feel this kind of frustration around how our current and back then even more education system is really creating individuals are just becoming one kind of worker or another. I have to make this choice that I felt like why art or film or dance is just something that can only be a hobby or something I enjoy on the side rather than I could truly understand what it means and why people would devote their time to it. So I decided to go to the Island School of Design and study fine art but it really comes from this kind of, I'm going to give myself a two-year gap year. Um, and after that, I promise myself I'll go back to Google <laughs> and like, uh, become an engineer of um, any sorts. Uh, but I have to say, like, the time in RISD was really um, the first time in my life that I was given a task to do anything I wanted to do in my life. I was always a good student. I always was seeking for the right answers. like. And that process was extremely difficult. The first year, I couldn't make anything. I ended up reading for most of the time. I didn't make any work. Um, and I felt like my teachers were very disappointed at me. And until almost before, right before graduation, I was partially forced, but also like slowly was able to find there's something I want to talk about. And then that's when I first made my artwork in the age of 20. Three, and I think I got addicted afterwards. <laughs> um, maybe I missed this in your explanation in your lecture. Well, why would you pick rocket degrees, plastic bottles, and oil to turn into art? These are things that I consider materials that pollute the world. Why would you do that, convert into art? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think they are, to me, very important 
cultural objects that, like you said, noted on what have we done to the world. And if you look, going back to the presentation I was talking about, my relationship with the nature and the world isn't really kind of idealistic rainforest or the beautiful ocean. I grew up in an oil field. Like I saw how artificial everything was made around me. We have a lake and a fish was shipped from another place and then so people come fishing in this artificial lake. So I think in order to live better with the world, we have to confront those degrees and to, to know what we have done. So yes, they are not the most um, pristine materials, uh, but for me, that is a nature we have to be able to live with nowadays. Um, I think once in medicine, so um, you know, for, for the Haas, I hope I am a participant. So I always felt like um, it, it is sort of an immigrant experience is for a better life. And when you talk about metabolism, talking about you know, being a woman and being a mother for the next generation, a lot to move on. I also felt like you know there is a part of arts and music that is sort of pass on the you know instead of having a biological kid, you actually have a spiritual kid, or you have a kid so you know carry on what you believe. So how do you you know would, would you be interested in working on that part, or how do you incorporate that part of uh, metabolism into the one that more scientific? You know, in medicine there's a science part, there's art part, and so for, for me is that you know I feel like the when you put that the humanity part into your project? Yeah, I think for me, so first of all, my mom is an OB doctor, so and my parents are both surgeons, so I'm very close to the medical practice um, growing up. For me, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to wrap my head a little bit around your question. I think um, metabolism and this process of passing on is something I have to admit I'm still battling with because as an artist it's so much or the story of an artist is always this idea of a genius right so like it's about like mm -hmm. I was the, the, the smartest person in the room etc so I do feel like there is a process even by conversations, talking to my friends and my partners and my families about having a kid is teaching me a lot of, of giving because I'm terrified about that process myself, um, especially because my mom is an OB doctor. I know what that means to, to do my body, my house, and yeah, it could be beautiful, but at the same time, Every choice, every gain in life is, is also a form of sacrifices. And I really relate to what you talk about in terms of immigration, the idea of having a better life. And I honestly have never thought really much more about it until after the completion of Living Distance. I think I was always a student, I came to US for school, and then did art degree and keep going, I right? like, why not? But only after that work uh, was completed, and I shared it with a friend back home, and she told me that she says a very strong of homesickness in the work, and I'm happy to share the link uh, with the audience later, you can watch it on Vimeo, is that when I realized that I'm losing certain languages I was able to speak, I'm losing many, many cultural references and the way I can joke, um, I love my partner, but he could never understood the person I was before uh, I moved to the United States. So I think there's part of me that died or left behind, and there's part of me that is, you know, growing as I entered this new world. So for me, reconciling and recognize that and understand there's no forever growth. There's always death involved. Is something both personally, I think it's important for my practice, but also I think it is important for our current society to realize, because we've been told that there's always advancements, always growth. We're kind of abandoning everything behind us, marching forward. I think right now we're facing the consequences of that belief. I feel like there's a theme that has come up through several of your answers 
um, about a system that is ever in motion, um, e humanity always in motion, in migration, and moving toward uh, a goal for, for the purpose of gain, but there's loss involved behind. And those who are in that, in that uh, transition, as you talked about the person who first called you an Asian American, there's that sense of gain and loss or of trying to teeter between the two. Um, that fascinates me, um, uh, especially in terms of ha, but, and, and in terms of what you spoke about, developing a, 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 a was it a predictive text or um, some sort of mechanism to um, draw parallels across the various um, uh, uh, immigrants that, have, that are in interviewed that have come from very different societies. Um, there are many, many, many parallels. Um, I just wondered if, um, I, I, I suddenly envisioned what, you know, that plan that you had as being much greater on a global scale um, because as humanity, uh, the, 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 the uh, movement is endless and the losses continue and the gains. And somehow, I know this is very unfocused, but at the same time, I was thinking about um, what people leave, what they lose. Um, and I was thinking about oil as well, because um, Houston, you said it's so logical to be in Texas and do a project about oil. Um, Houston is so deeply connected to oil and also teeter and at the same time and totally connected to that, a, an immigrant city. Uh, on a very large scale, um, and also teetering between loss and gain because um, we're not aware of the ecological disaster that we, we live very, very close to since many, many thousands of miles of pipeline come underground and converge on our port. Um, and right, there's the Permian Basin not a, a hundred miles from us and all of the pumping that's going on out in the Gulf. And yet, this is one of the most um, fertile regions of the United States at the same time. It all sort of clicked together in my mind as you're speaking, um, uh, as this loss gain, this migration, and this need for energy, for fuel, for, you know, for health at the same time. Um, uh, often there's devastation behind. Um, and, Foremost in my mind right now is one um, amazing uh, family that I spent a great deal of time with interviewing here that are ecological um, refugees um, in Houston from an area in Africa that is the most polluted place in the world um, because of oil extraction. Um, and they ran for their lives um, and were deposited here in Houston. Uh, it, that was caused by shell oil, and they were deposited here in Houston, uh, which has the uh, the North American headquarters of shell oil. So a great irony to it um, that seemed to represent so much of what I'm, in a very vague way, trying to convey. Just Thank thought, you. Just thoughts. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think you're right. All the things are very intertwined, and I felt like slowly that my journey of being an artist. Um, I'm very glad it's such a mess in a way because that would take me maybe decades to slowly untangle my thoughts. I don't have a conclusion, I don't have answers, um, but I think that's what draws me to keep making works. Yeah. I, I so appreciate the humanity in your work. Thank you. That, that you see such humanity in, in the most technical of technological efforts. Thank you. Thank you for that. Is this me? One of the things I really enjoy that I know in my own growth and education, I love the idea that art is no longer siloed. It is so much more joined with science and technology, which broadens the audience and understanding among people. It becomes more of a vehicle. It's not just something that people need to go necessarily to a particular museum to understand. But behind a lot of art, traditional sense, there's this sense of hope. And could you define what your sense of hope is through your art? 
I think I'm very hopeful because in my work you can tell that I'm critical of lots of things. But I think instead of like pointing fingers and blaming a big infrastructure for everything that was wrong with the world, I'm much more interested in the people and how they made those decisions. Even talking about oil, um, I don't have that much hatred towards it, maybe um, contrary to you might think, because without oil, I won't be here. Right? It is my home. It is three generations building a world after the world after the war, because without it, they, my grandparents could likely already um, die at a very young age. Um, so, in a way, what I'm interested in is how do we make decisions in those um, moments, and what is the transitional conversations that we can have, um, rather than be like there's only only one white or black way of moving forward. I think that's that's a bit reductive. So I don't like that again. Like I think I don't have a solution because if I saw, I would be running the president somewhere. Um, <laughs> but I think art and particular storytelling mm -hmm. is a way that can only um, guide us. Um, through those difficult times and making compromises to each other and but at the same time I, I really believe as a whole we can push for something that is, is better for the world but I don't think humanity is gonna be like one day perfect yeah. right so and it's somehow again like that kind of destruction and death is, is part of being human and you know like I think lots of people are confused about those kind of questions and they go to places and try to find answers no matter it is political science or religion or family ethos I think art making is my process to find that ethos and um, moral ground or the way to deal with life and having I'll say a spiritual journey um, as a person here you know, reflect your thoughts and your observation to this world. Uh, world. I think it's very persuasive and effective, I really like that. So, because I'm from art history department, so I'm interested in, while you are uh, doing your uh, art creating work, uh, do you think about, uh, like, do you consider your position or uh, the position of your work in relation to the field of the you know contemporary art or art history. Do you, do you consider that part, or uh, do you reflect that part in your artwork? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I have like a rather embarrassing answer for you. Mm -hmm. um, like you know, my history with art making and my education. I really didn't know much about art until I went to RISD, and I have still no idea what it admittedly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. And like honestly, I didn't even know who is like Duchamp until I was a grad student, and then everyone was talking about him, and I had to like secretly Google it on the side. <laughs> um, but to me, I think art is culture, and I slowly have been learning about art history. But I, I don't think we should like limit like whether you're contributing to art history. I could. At this point, after 10 years of studying, I could go back to and talk about land art. I could go back to talk about how this history of like um, experimentation, um, Blackstone College, and they are all pathways that you could, as art historian, to look at and how it helped people like me to be able, let's say, even to go to art school like this. But I try to be not too dogmatic about it because I think there was a period of my time uh, when I first graduated from RISD, I was really trying to become an artist and like very much in my presentation, in my work, 
and like trying to make this connection with, with art history. But and then I realized it was uh, rather uh, unnecessary because as an art historian, you are always looking at the society and every art, when it was made, was contemporary. And I think I, I now decided to be more um, true to my own background. And I would be very confident in saying that I know and I can talk extensively about art history that relating to my work. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very um, equipped as a scientist, as an engineer, um, and as someone who lived with my experiences. And all of that together is, is the foundation for the art, rather than trying to become an artist that is just like making a little tweak in art history. <laughs> They will be performing in October, but we hope to bring them to campus if possible. So thank you all. Stay tuned, we have more programs. Thank you. And